Welcome. Good morning. Welcome. Pause for faith. Let me check my video again. Yep. All those echoes. I think we are streaming. It's good to be with you. My name's Father Stephen Wang. I'm sitting here in the University Chaplaincy in central London on the 2nd of April 2020, um, 11 o'clock in the morning, London time. We've had a lot of chat about being together in lockdown, about families, the examples of the disciples in Capernaum, the example of the Holy Family in Nazareth. So I thought it would be good to think this morning and then to pray at the end, but to think this morning about what it means to be in isolation. So many people are not living with the enforced chaos of family life. So many people are living with time alone. Um, they're just getting on with things. They may be working from home. They may be not. They may be students or retired or whatever. And, and this lockdown in so many countries has given you so much unexpected and possibly unwanted time alone. So what does it mean to live this isolation well? There's so many ways of living it not well. Um, there's so many struggles and temptations, but what does it mean to live in isolation as well as we can in general and as, as Christian people? I think maybe you're feeling the pressure with all these, the news and the social media. Someone sent me this thing that's going around social media at the moment. I'll read it to you. It's meant to encourage us, and it, and it does, but also, it creates its own pressure. Here's the quote. You've probably seen this. While in quarantine, Shakespeare wrote King Lear. While in quarantine, Isaac Newton developed calculus and discovered gravity. While under house arrest, Paul wrote part of the New Testament. While in prison, John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Consider what kingdom work you could do while staying home. Great. So, look, I find that inspiring, as in there's this incredible opportunity in this gift. There's so many memes and social media posts going around about how to use the time well, groups you can join, hobbies you can start, amazing ways you can build, God, build God's kingdom and change the world, like Shakespeare, Newton, St. Paul and John Bunyan. But also, it can increase the pressure a little bit and make me feel, well, I've got to use all this time really well and really usefully. But in fact, the very thing I'm struggling with is feeling a bit stuck, isolated and lonely. And this pressure is making things worse, not better. OK, anyway, there's the meme. There's the, the social media. What can we learn from, from some of the great saints? Um, and I don't just mean canonized saints. I mean the holy people. That have gone before us, including um, someone I'm going to speak about. I had a list of three. I thought I'd jump through three saints. The people that came to mind because of their isolation was Julian of Norwich, St Thomas More, his time in prison, and Cardinal Van Tuan. And I ended up making so many notes about Cardinal Van Tuan that I think this is enough for our 20-25 minutes. So we'll come back to Julian of Norwich and Thomas More if it interests you and if there's time. Let me just tell you the story of Cardinal Francis Xavier Van Tuan, wonderful, wonderful Vietnamese bishop and cardinal. Tell you his story. Most of what it means for you, you can work out yourself. And I might throw a few thoughts and comments in as we go along. <coughs> Excuse me. Cardinal Van Tuan, born in Vietnam in 1928. I won't tell you his whole story. I'll, I'll put some articles to his life into the comments and the description of the video when we've finished. But a long story short, in 1967, Pope Paul VI appointed him Bishop of Nha Trang. Forgive my non-Vietnamese um, pronunciation. He was the first Vietnamese bishop of this diocese after various missionary bishops, and he was a passionate worker for the diocese and for the Lord, building up the laity with, with various formation programs, lots of work for vocations and for the priesthood, lots of work for justice and peace. Just a, it seems a wonderful, loving, 
very active, um, relatively young bishop from 1967 to 1975. In 1975, the middle of the, the Vietnam War, he was created coadjutor bishop of Saigon, meaning the supportive bishop who would then take the place of the, the actual bishop when he retired. But just only a few days later after he was appointed, um, the, the South Vietnam fell to the North Vietnamese. And so here is this Catholic bishop um, newly appointed as coadjutor bishop of Saigon, and he goes into basically 13 years of what was called re-education camp, confinement, prison, 13 years, nine years of which was spent in solitary confinement. Generally, usually, the conditions were terrible. So here is this uh, relatively young, energetic, passionate bishop suddenly thrown from this massive activity and and building the kingdom and working within his diocese suddenly thrown into prison and then into solitary confinement. You can see we're not experiencing that at all, but just the, the, the little parallels and the echoes between our daily lives out there in the world and many of us being in lockdown and possibly yourself feeling very isolated and alone. The conditions were terrible in prison. But Bishop Van Tuan made a decision to live every moment with love and not to give in to despair. And this is what colours the whole of those 13 years. I found a few quotations from his writings online. So I'll just read this paragraph now. He said, The hardest thing above all else was that I began to feel helpless. My plans my efforts and my activities were all for nothing. This practical helplessness describes my condition for 13 years. I wanted to do so many things to serve my people, but I could not. Then I came to think about Jesus on the cross, that he was immobilised. He could neither preach nor administer any sacraments. He too was helpless, inverted commas. Nevertheless, it was from there that he performed his greatest deed. He redeemed us sinners. Thanks to his help, I have never regretted my destiny. So just that was his instinct. Look how helpless I am and how there's nothing I can do but to try and rethink that and what does it mean? What does my understanding of busyness and activity and, and doing the Lord's work actually mean? So what was he actually going to do with his time? How is he going to live this? Here's another quotation, a beautiful paragraph from the book Five Loaves and Two Fish that he wrote later on. He said, above all, I suffered long tribulation of nine years in solitary confinement, seeing only two guards every day, enduring mental torture with no work to do, having to walk back and forth in my small cell from morning to night. I was on the brink of insanity. One night a voice encouraged me from the depths of my heart. Why do you torment yourself so? You must learn to distinguish between God and the works of God. And this is still the Lord speaking to him in his words. The Lord saying to Bishop Van Tuan, everything you have done, pastoral activities, projects, are God's work, but they are not God. I'll read that again. Everything you have done is God's work, but it is not God. And then he goes on, when the communists threw me into the hold of the ship, Hai Fong, with another 1,500 starving and desperate prisoners to be transported to the north, I thought, Lord, here is my cathedral. Here are my people. Lord, you send me here to be love among my brothers. Yes, I am your missionary here. 
From that moment onwards, a new peace flooded my heart and remained with me for 13 years. What a wonderful thing to say. Here in this prison of this, this ship, imprisoned with 1,500 other people, here is my cathedral. Can you say about the room where you're sitting now, here is my cathedral, here is my parish church, I can't go to Mass this Sunday. I couldn't last Sunday. I wish I could. But can you say, in God's mysterious plans, this is where he wants me to be. And I need to make this my church, my home, my place of worship, as well as the whole of my life. And at the beginning, with all these thoughts swirling in his mind, Van Tuan was aware of the temptation to think, I'm just going to sit this out. I'm going to wait out this time, however long, until I can get back to the important work of being a bishop later on when I'm free. But he realised that would have been mistake, a mistake. And I quote, he said, I will live the present moment, filling it to the brim with love. I will live the present moment, filling it to the brim with love. If you were to permit me to choose, I would change nothing because you are with me. I am no longer afraid. I have understood. I am following you in your passion and in your resurrection. So there's his inner attitude, not to give up, not to just wait it out, but to say, this is where I'm meant to be now. How can I accept this? Unite my sufferings with Jesus Christ. How can I love how can I love in this situation? But he's still thinking as this very active bishop, well, is there something God wants me to do? To do. And I quote him again. There's some lovely quotes here. Then late one night, he wrote, as he recorded in his biography, Five Loaves and Two Fishes, he says, he heard the voice of God saying, Francis, it is very simple. Imitate what St Paul did when he was in prison. Write letters to the church communities. So the Lord said to his bishop, I want you to be like St Paul. And he did the best he could. He had a calendar in prison. I, I guess just one of those, I don't know, 365 pages, one page a day. He smuggled, he, he wrote little messages on, on scraps of paper from his calendar and elsewhere messages of encouragement, not just like a, a diary for himself, but very conscious that he was trying to reach out to his people. He smuggled these out, these messages out, eventually through sympathetic guards and through children who were playing outside that sometimes he could manage to get in touch with. These little scraps of paper got to his, his people, the, the, the Catholics, um, that knew him. They were copied by hand, they were circulated, and eventually they were brought together in a, in, a, in a collection and eventually published as the book which you can buy today online if you want to, The Road to Hope. Scraps of paper, a, a little bit of inspiration from the Lord and sharing that with others. This became his mission for the next 13 years. He was moved between prison and prison and re-education camps. And in these mad, terrible circumstances, he managed to be writing, sharing with his people. He ordained some priests clandestinely, secretly. I'll come on to the beauty of the way he did manage to celebrate mass sometimes and to share his faith with those around him who had no faith. Let me tell you the story of the masses. Of course, Basically, he couldn't say mass when he got to prison. It's heartbreaking for anyone, especially for a priest, a bishop, where that's part of their daily routine. And I can't imagine what it's like to be in that situation. Here am I in lockdown, but with the chapel and the sacristy and able to celebrate mass with the students I live with. But eventually, some friends of his managed to smuggle in some tiny pieces of bread and to smuggle in a little bottle that they called medicine. It wasn't so much a white lie as just a, 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 a trick, if you like. It, it was truly medicine for the soul, um, a little bottle of wine, saying that the bishop uh, needed this, which he did. So he had 
little bits of bread, tiny bits of bread, and, and a few drops of wine in this medicine bottle. And so the bishop, he would he didn't have a chalice or an altar or a, a, a ciborium or a pattern. So what he would do is he poured two or three drops of wine into one hand. His, his hand became the chalice. And he held the bread in, in the palms of his other hand. And, and in his prison cell there, with, with the bread and the wine in his two hands for chalice and pattern and altar, he, he celebrated the mass. He said the words of the mass by heart. He prayed the scriptures by heart. He consecrated the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And, and the, the miracle that, that this man was able to celebrate mass in those conditions, to pray the mass, to offer the sacrifice, so that his prison cell literally became a cathedral and the darkness of the prison was turned into light. Here is his account. Quote, I will never be able to express my immense joy every day with three drops of wine and one drop of water in the palm of my hand. I celebrated my mass. In the re-education camp, we slept on common beds and everyone had the right to 50 centimetres of space. We arranged it, he says, so that there were five Catholics sleeping near me. At 9.30 in the evening, I curled up on the bed to celebrate mass by heart and I distributed communion under the mosquito nets covering us. We reserved the blessed sacrament in small containers from cigarette packets. Jesus in the Eucharist was always with me in my shirt pocket. At night, the prisoners took turns for adoration. Jesus was among us to heal all our physical and mental suffering. Amazing. And look, I have I forgot my incredible high tech here. Unable still to flash images on the screen. I'm going to show you my mobile phone. Right. Two things. Here is a photo of Cardinal Antoine. Can you see that OK? Yeah. So there he is. You can just look him up on Google Images or somewhere. There's the Cardinal. But then this is what I want to show you. There is some, um, have I lost it? Oh, here we go. There is a beautiful picture, a painting of this very moment of Cardinal Van Tuan with the wine drops in one hand and the bread in the other, praying mass in his prison cell. Can you see that image there? I'll put the link in this image um, into, the, into the comments afterwards. This painting, if I can find the, the artist, I've forgotten his name. It's, it's a painting from the chapel, the Australian chapel in Rome. I'd love to see it because it's also the same artist. I will give him due credit um, in the, the comments and I'll give you a link to his website. Beautiful, beautiful contemporary Australian artist. And he's done a beautiful image of Cardinal St. John Henry Newman, which is in the Australian chapel in Rome and that we've, with his permission and doing all the copyright things properly, we've got in our own chapel now and I can share that with you later on. So there is he loving, praying, writing, but what about all the people who didn't share his faith? Well, here's a lovely story that his faith was such a help to the Catholics and the other Christians who were full of faith. It was such a help and an encouragement to those who maybe had lost their faith and, and could be renewed in their faith. But it was also a blessing to so many other people that didn't share his faith. I'm just quoting from an article in Catholic World Report now. When the prison guards asked if he felt resentment towards them for his imprisonment, Bishop Van Tuan only assured them of his concern and love for them. His love was both bewildering and contagious. Government officials soon discovered prison guards questioning communist ideals and singing the, sanct the Veni Sancte Spiritus while working. As a result, government officials were constantly changing Archbishop Tuan's prison guards because Christian ideals were infecting die-hard communists. But by the time the guards were moved away, the saintly prisoner 
had already imprinted his ideals in their hearts, like the persecuted Catholics that preceded him. So this, this incredible example, so many stories about Christians being in prison, having, as it were, inverted commas, terrible effects on their guards by their example, meaning showing them the love of Jesus and, and their love for them despite the terrible circumstances. And there's the authorities wanting to swap his guards quickly because he was having too much of an influence on them and realising that in the end this just becomes impossible. He was eventually released um, under lots of global pressure in 1988 to house arrest. In 1991, he was allowed to visit Rome and he stayed. He made the decision to stay there because it was too difficult to go back. And he lived in Rome for the next 11 years from 91 to 2002. He had various positions in the Vatican, especially working for social justice in the Vatican in that period, lived a very, very simple, poor, humble life, um, was much loved by many people, um, was very close to, to St. John Paul II, and he died of cancer in 2002, aged 74. He is a venerable, he's a servant of God, meaning his heroic virtues have been recognised. It's, it's been recognised how saintly he, he is, how holy his life was, and his process of beatification is, is in process. So there's, there's every hope that um, if, if things work out well and the required miracles and the required processes, that he would be declared a blessed. Um, I think this takes place at the local level, first of all, in Vietnam. And then if it's God's will for him to be beatified, and if it is God's will to be canonized, which would be such a blessing for the church. Let me finish with a couple of quotations from, from his famous book there that you can find, and I'll put um, online afterwards as well. Slightly random quotations. Little preface. If you're feeling discouraged by what you're doing and you wish you were somewhere else, well, listen to him now. The workman will become a saint in the workplace. The soldier will become a saint in the army. The patient will become a saint in the hospital. The student will become a saint through his studies. The farmer will become a saint on the farm. The politician will become a saint in government office. And the priest will become a saint by faithfully fulfilling his priestly ministry. Every step of progress along the road to sanctity is a step of sacrifice in the performance of one's duty. Beautiful. Don't wish too much too quickly to be elsewhere. Maybe eventually you do need to be elsewhere, but right now, live where you are. The old Irish phrase, grow where you are planted. Um, play the hand you've been dealt, all these cliches, but the, 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 the way that the Lord calls us to be holy in the present moment by fulfilling our duties, whatever they are today. And he goes on, in order to become a saint, you need only to fulfill your duty in the present moment. The revelation and discovery of this simple fact should give your soul peace and encouragement. Do you see how relevant this is to us? In your lockdown, in your life being turned upside down, so much of you poss possibly is thinking, I wish it wasn't like this. Or I'll settle down when things get back to normal. Well, I hope they will. And I wish it wasn't like this. But the Cardinal is saying to us, right now, you can find peace and encouragement if you accept that today, this is what God is asking of you, not something else, not to be somewhere else, not to be someone else, but to do what you can here in this, these circumstances, to love, to do your your daily duties, to, to, to fulfil your responsibilities, even with your weaknesses, to do the best you can with today in the present moment. That is a lot. He goes on. This is his words, not mine now. You keep complaining. If only I were in this place or that place, if only I could work with this or that person or hold this or that office, surely I would succeed. No, he says. 
Do the work the Lord has entrusted to you. You are exactly where he wants you. Proceed from there. If you continue to bustle about in every other direction, you will never reach the end. And finally, two quotes about, well, one quote about prayer. Let me give you this. It's a lovely quote. Prayer is of prime importance in our lives. Second is sacrifice. And only in third place is activity. I'll say that again. Prayer is of prime importance in our lives. Second is sacrifice. And only in third place is activity. And the final quote about our temptation, especially now to, to overthink, to overworry, and to think honestly a little bit about ourselves too much when we've got so much time to think about ourselves. Here's the quote. Each day, you must decrease in self-centeredness and increase in love of neighbour. Each day, decrease in self-reliance and instead increase your trust in God. Lovely quotes. And I'll put a link to his book with a thousand and one quotes, literally, and you can read that. So look, lots of encouragement from Cardinal Van Tuan. Um, his decision to love, his desire to, to accept God's mysterious will, his acceptance of what he can't do, that the lack of activity, but then very gently with the help of God, his discerning what he can do to, to love, to pray, to encourage others. You can't write messages on bits of paper and part them, pass them to your neighbour, but can you write messages to those you love? Can you call people? Can you text people? The human personal touch, the love of neighbour, the prayer for your neighbour, turning your, your room into a centre of, of missionary love for, for those you know and even those you don't, turning your, your room, your home into a cathedral, a place of worship and praise and prayer in, in all your weakness, just like Cardinal Van Tuan. What a wonderful exa example he is for us. And look, I can't encourage you in um, public veneration of Cardinal Van Tuan because he's, he's not a, a blessed or a saint, but I can encourage you in private devotion to him. Um, we must pray for him. He's not beatified or canonized. So our default is always to pray for the souls of the faithful departed, for anyone who has died. So we pray for him. But also, I believe, and I can encourage you privately to pray to him, um, because he, I think he is such a wonderful example of Christian life. And I hope and pray and I believe that he is in heaven now, privately and personally. Let's wait for the church to confirm that, God willing. Let's pray together um, at the end of this time and just make sure that this is a time not just of, of, of listening and, and talking, but also of praying. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A prayer for those affected by the current situation. Merciful God, come to the help of your people. Be our shelter in this time of peril and strengthen the bonds of our community. Bring healing to all who suffer the ravages of disease and assist those whose skill and art can put an end to this affliction. Affliction Through Christ our Lord. Amen. A prayer for the household, for my household and for yours, wherever you are. Hear us, Lord, and send your angel from heaven to visit and protect, to comfort and defend all who live in this house. Amen. And let us pray together to our Blessed Mother and ask her to pray for us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John Henry Newman, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for being with me. Um, we'll be back live if you're free for that time. In fact, slightly different time, 8.30pm London time tonight, because I've got a meeting at 6.30 that might run on. And we're going to pray the perpetual novena to, to Our Lady of Perpetual Succor. So join me 
to have some devotions tonight, if you can, at 8.30 London time. Please do subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. Um, there's, a, there's a button somewhere you can subscribe on YouTube. And do share this if you found it helpful. Thank you very much. God bless.